True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. The ostensibly charmed marriage of Kelly and Jim Cannon became something like a bad Lifetime movie after years of drug addiction and domestic disturbances. Now, judging from outward appearances, these two were a successful and happy couple, raising a young family. Jim was a law school graduate and a well-liked businessman. Kelly was a housewife and a mother of three, remembered by her old school classmates as a good student and a popular cheerleader. But then, one night in 2008, Jim's dead body was found inside of a bedroom closet in their Nashville home. Join us at the quiet end for A Body in the Closet. When Jim was found dead, his three children were missing. Police found Kelly Cannon in a nearby condo with the children, and she explained that Jim had called her, acting crazy, and asked her to take care of the kids. But this was a problem because an injunction prevented Kelly from entering the family home So, was she telling the truth about this, or was Kelly somehow responsible for her estranged husband's death? Now, you could probably make an educated guess about this one. Uh, Yeah, I think she'll be held responsible. (laughs) Well, let's hope so. If she is responsible, we want her held that way. That's the only way to do it. Absolutely. So, we've got a nice Tennessee beer today. It's from Yazoo Brewing Company in Madison, Tennessee, and the beer is Dos Perros an American brown ale, 4.9% alcohol by volume. Not a bad beer. I'm not a big fan of browns because I, I don't think they have much to recommend them, but this one was pretty good. It's a dark brown color with a tiny tan head, nice aroma, caramel, a little hint of chocolate, and the taste follows the nose, primarily a caramel taste and a, more of a hint of chocolate. Medium bodied, easy drinking. Let's do a couple. That sounds great. Hey, I don't know if I told you, but I was going to have some t-shirts made up that say, The Taste Follows the Nose, with a little cartoon of you and a snifter to add to our t-shirts. Wouldn't that be cool? That'd be cool. All right. I'm going to look into that, so stay tuned, everybody. Let's open this up. All right. Okay, Dickie, so once again, a marriage gone totally to shit. (laughs) You ready to talk about it? Well, yeah, like we could almost look at this as couples therapy for us, right? Yeah, and maybe, you know, just a warning for people who are younger and haven't married yet. Like, you know, watch out who you marry. Be careful. Boy, isn't that the truth. Yeah, really. Although I don't know if Jim really could have predicted that Kelly would be such a problem. She seemed pretty together in the beginning from what I could gather. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so no, sometimes you just don't know. Oh, you don't. It, yeah. It's definitely a crapshoot at times. <laughs> That's right. And this was not a good gamble for Jim. As so. it turns out, it certainly wasn't. No, and not to make fun of it because it is really sad and tragic, of course. So come on down here to the quiet end, and I'm going to have you start us off as usual. Okay. So looking at today's case, this is one of those terrible, tragic situations which no one could have predicted. I agree. The couple, Jim and Kelly, really did seem ideal. And for a short time, at the beginning of their union at least, they may have been. So let's start with Kelly, who certainly had a lot of advantages starting out in life. She had been a national debutante. Kelly was raised by her mother, Diane, who stayed at home to raise Kelly and her two brothers, and her father, Stan, who was a plastic surgeon. Kelly was a student at Tennessee's finest private schools. She was a cheerleader and prom queen at Harpeth Hall. That's an exclusive prep school for girls in Nashville. Yeah, there are several well-known women who graduated from there. And the one I can think of off the top of my head who's really famous is Reese Witherspoon. Well, that's a famous person. She's quite famous, yes. Yeah, pretty So neat. that's the kind of people that she was going to school with, some really wealthy, up-and-coming people. 
Yeah, well, certainly with a father who's a plastic surgeon, I'm figuring they did quite well. Yeah, that's one of the better paid doctor jobs, as they say. Yeah, it is. And part of that is because a lot of it is self-pay and not cheap. And you can you can make a pretty good living as a plastic surgeon. <laughs> now, after high school, Kelly did go to college, of course, and she joined a sorority. After graduating in 1989, she applied for a position as a writer in the PR department at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. So she was hired there to write informational brochures for exhibits and promote the space program. So it was a pretty good career path she had started. It was. But she worked there for just two years, and then she decided to move back to Nashville. In Nashville, Kelly then took a job as deputy press secretary for the former Tennessee governor, Ned Ray McWhorter. And she ended up leaving that job to enroll in some pre-med courses at Lipscomb University. Because then she had this dream, well, maybe she would follow in her father's footsteps and have a career in medicine. Yeah, you know, she sounds like she's kind of drifting around here. A little drifty. You know, she, she did have the job right out of college. Mm-hmm. A couple years there, and then she moves back to Nashville. She's working for a former governor. And then she left that job to go to med school. Yeah, I think she was a little bit restless, a little bit unsure. Oh, definitely. And that'll turn out being just part of her personality, I believe. Now, Kelly started dating Cannon, Jim Cannon, an attorney, while she was in med school. They're both in their 20s, but they had actually met years earlier when Kelly and Jim's sister were friends at Harpeth Hall. Jim's friends welcomed Kelly into their group right away, but Kelly's parents were not at all thrilled with Jim. Jim's mother and father had divorced when he was young, and he was estranged from his sister. So that, those are black marks, at least in uh, Kelly's family eyes. The other thing was perhaps more important. Jim had financial issues. Okay, but bear with me here. These are very superficial, um, prematurely judgy type things. They're not saying Jim didn't treat their daughter right, or he was mean or rude, or nothing like that. They're judging him by his parents getting divorced when he was young, which he has no control over. We don't know why he was estranged from his sister, but it certainly didn't have to be his fault or have to be a black mark on who he was ethically. And financial issues, okay, maybe he had been a bit irresponsible, we don't know. But he certainly didn't have the benefits starting out that Kelly did. So I think her parents just wanted her to get somebody with old money, as they say. You're right. Yeah, so I'm not a big fan right there. Now, it turns out that Jim had just filed for bankruptcy right before Kelly told her parents they were engaged. Although he seemed like a nice guy, he wasn't what Kelly's parents had envisioned for their daughter's future husband. Now, even though her parents weren't thrilled about her choices, they gave Kelly, who is their only daughter, a very extravagant wedding, one that she would never forget. Yeah, Kelly and Jim got married back in 1996. After that, Kelly left medical school to focus on having a family. And from some of the reading I've done, it seems like she was kind of looking for a reason to leave medical school. She wasn't really that committed to it. So she goes... Well, you know, if, if you're doing something because you think it'll be viewed favorably by a family member or something like that, it's probably not what you want to do. Exactly. That's really not the best way to do it. So their first son, Tim, was born in 1998, and then two years later, in 2000, they had another son who they named Henry. Jim's career and earnings really skyrocketed that year after he stopped practicing law, and he founded his own company, Medical Reimbursements of America, or MRA for short. So this was a firm that collected bad debts for hospitals, and this made Jim a multimillionaire. Things were definitely looking up for the family after that, even though Jim did make some enemies along the way. Jim's career and earnings really skyrocketed that year after he stopped practicing law and he founded his own company, Medical Reimbursements of America, or MRA for short. This was a firm that collected bad debts for hospitals, and this made him a multimillionaire. So things were definitely looking up for the family, at least financially, but Jim did make some enemies along the way. For one, he had an ex-partner who said that Jim had cheated him out of $250,000. Huh. 
Yeah. Not an insignificant amount. No. Did that get resolved? It didn't really get resolved, but the only reason I bring it up is because Kelly kind of took the ex-partner's side in this. So that's kind of a sign of a little bit of a tear in the relationship already, in my opinion. Wow. And that's only, what, three, four years into the marriage. Yes, yes. So I'm not sure why she took the ex-partner's side. It could have been that the ex-partner was right. It could have been that there were already issues in the marriage, which wouldn't be surprising. But that's how it was going. So Jim and Kelly were able to buy a big house. It was a fixer-upper, but they were excited about that. But then in 2003, while Kelly was working on fixing up this house, she fell and injured her back. Her doctor prescribed some narcotic pain medication for her, but Kelly really liked how the pills made her feel a little too much. She became addicted, and in 2003, she entered a, into a treatment program. And treatment seemed to work for a while, but Kelly still had recurring trouble with drugs and alcohol. In 2006, she gave birth to their daughter, Sophie, so that was a bright spot. But then things did continue to slowly spiral downward. In the summer of 2007, Kelly believed that her husband was having an affair with a woman who worked in his office. Now, she confronted him about this. He denied the affair, but then later on he admitted to it, at least according to Kelly. Life was difficult for Kelly. She felt isolated, at home, caring for her three kids. Now, trying to do the right thing, she did go to a psychiatrist for help and was put on an antidepressant, but she didn't like how the medication made her feel. It made her sleepy, and she drank a lot of caffeine just to function. But in truth, it turned out that Kelly had never completely stopped taking opiates. No, I think it was something she never could fully kick. Well, it doesn't sound like it. I mean, even, even when she would go through the rehab, it didn't take very long for her to relapse on the outside. No, and we even have some evidence that she made efforts to get out early before she was even really um, off of the drugs. So in 2005, Kelly had begun doctor shopping to get prescriptions for Lortab, Percocet, and Oxycontin for her alleged back pain. But the belief is that she really didn't have back pain anymore. To avoid being caught, Kelly had her prescriptions filled at different small drug stores around Nashville. Since Kelly had never had back surgery and her back pain had seemingly been resolved, Jim realized that his wife had a drug problem. So she had repeated stays in rehab to try and get off the drugs, but unfortunately she always went back to them. So this was very difficult. And at this point I think we can have some sympathy for her, of course. She was taking 90 to 100 10 milligram pills every month. Then in February of 2008, Kelly started telling Jim that she was hearing voices. She heard these around the house, and when she was talking to someone on the phone, she'd hear these voices. To avoid any confrontations with his wife, Jim was the type of guy who would just leave the house. Kelly would stop him often from leaving by hiding his briefcase and his wallet. Now the children's nanny would recall that Kelly always had drugs hidden around the house. And when Kelly couldn't get enough narcotics, she would drink Delsum cough syrup all day long. And she began to spend all of her days around the house in a house dress, popping pills and drinking cough syrup. So this had gotten pretty bad. This sounds bad. Yeah. Now one evening, Jim begged Kelly to give him his things so he could leave an argument they were having and check into a hotel for the night. After three hours of arguing back and forth, Jim called the National Police Department for help. When the police arrived, Jim went outside to meet them. But as soon as he shut the door, Kelly locked him out. Now for several minutes, the police knocked on the front door. Finally, Kelly opened it and handed over the briefcase. After talking to Jim about Kelly's behavior, the police decided that someone should spend the night with her and the children if Jim was going to stay in a hotel. Jim called the nanny, and she and her roommate agreed to stay with Kelly and the kids. After midnight that night, Jim left the house and checked into a nearby hotel. He was only there for about two hours when he got a call from the nanny and Kelly, and for the next two hours over the speakerphone, Kelly complained that she was hearing voices. Then the call just ended abruptly. The next morning, the nanny called Jim back. She was worried because Kelly had been verbally abusing her younger son, Henry. She was accusing the child of conspiring against her with the voices she was hearing. 
So that's pretty scary. That sure is. The nanny told Jim that Kelly had made the boy cry. And the nanny had driven him to school and he had cried all the way there. So now Jim was feeling like he was at the end of his rope. It was bad enough for him to have problems with her. But to find out that she was really damaging the children was very upsetting. He filed divorce papers on March 1st, and just days later, a judge gave Jim temporary custody of all three of their children. He also issued restraining orders and an injunction to prevent Kelly from having any contact with Jim or the kids. He didn't really want to take the children from their mother, but he was concerned for their safety, and rightly so. Jim still loved Kelly, and he really wanted her to get better and be with him and their children. The couple was able to agree that Kelly could live in the house if she went for continued drug and alcohol treatment. So Kelly went off to Cumberland Heights Treatment Center that March. While she was there, Kelly wrote to her attorney to ask him to stop the divorce proceedings because she and Jim were trying to reconcile. She was released in early April 2008 and returned home, and the plan was for her to continue to get outpatient treatment. The restraining orders were still in effect when she returned home, but lawyers from both sides had agreed to leave everything in place for 60 days, see how it went, before they made any final decisions. Within a couple of months, Kelly began drinking and taking drugs again. In May, she got into the car with her daughter, tried to grab the other kids and take off. She ran over a bicycle, and she tried to run over Jim. Uh, As she drove off, she was going 70 miles an hour in a 35-mile-per-hour zone. Jim called the police, and they were pulling in as she was driving off. They didn't chase her because they didn't want her to crash the car. Through OnStar, they found her at a hotel in Brentwood, which is a suburb just south of Nashville. Yeah, Kelly was acting so crazy that Jim had called 911 that day. Kelly had grabbed Sophie, the baby, and put her in the car in the back seat. She then backed up over one of the boys' bicycles and hit Jim's car. Then she drove off down the road, speeding through the residential neighborhood. Officer George Ward was the first one to the scene. As he was driving there, he got his information from Jim through the dispatcher. And as he got close to the house, he saw the black GMC Yukon, driven by Kelly, coming down to the end of the Cannon driveway. He would say that Kelly looked right at him and made eye contact, and instead of chasing Kelly, the officer turned around and went back to the Cannon's house to talk to Jim. When he got out of his cruiser, he noticed Jim's shirt was ripped and had grass stains on it. Jim also had a bruise on his right arm. Jim told Ward that Kelly's car had on star, so they were able to track her. And as soon as other officers arrived at Jim's house, one of them contacted OnStar. With Jim's permission, the company was able to track down Kelly, and a warrant was taken out on Kelly for domestic assault, reckless endangerment, and evading arrest. So pretty serious. One of the other detectives helped Jim get an order of protection against Kelly as well. So Kelly's court date was scheduled for August 18th. Jim at this point was no longer willing to give Kelly another chance. She had gone too far and put the children's lives at risk. So Jim emailed his friend, attorney John Hollins, told him to go ahead with the divorce. Now, because of Kelly's addiction problems and dangerous behavior, Hollins was able to convince the judge that she was a danger to her family. And the judge issued an order banning Kelly from going back to the house and banning her from seeing the children. Yeah, I feel like it's too bad they weren't able to prove that she was a danger to herself, which seems obvious and get her into a psychiatric hospital for treatment. You know, whether she was addicted to drugs or not, she had serious psychiatric issues at this point. Certainly did. So after that incident, Kelly lived in different places. Actually, for about a week or two, no one even had a clue where she was staying, not even her kids. She was moving from one hotel to another. While Jim was with the kids, Kelly tried to make a new life for herself for a time. She even met a couple of men. Jim did find Kelly eventually, though, and he arranged to get her a rental located about five minutes from the house. So it kind of seems like he hadn't totally given up on Kelly. Well, he's still trying to help her. He's trying to help her, and I think if she could have gotten better, he was probably still a little bit open to fixing things. 
I think so. I think so, too. So, Sunday, July 22nd, 2008, Kelly Cannon got dressed up to meet her friend Amy Houston for dinner on West End Avenue in Nashville. Although Kelly hadn't talked to Amy for a while, she'd called her earlier that evening wanting to talk. Kelly was upset and sad, needed a friend to talk to. Hearing how upset Kelly was, Amy agreed to meet her. So Kelly ordered mac and cheese and a piece of pie. She ate a bit of the pie, but then had the waiter pack up the mac and cheese to go. Amy had already eaten, so she just had a glass of wine. Kelly also ordered a glass of wine, and she ended up drinking three glasses with Amy that, with Amy that evening. So, of course, she wasn't supposed to be doing that. She was supposed well, to be she's clean and sober. out of rehab again. She has, and part of her agreement with the husband was she couldn't see the kids if she was still using. Although, at this point, he was sure that she was, so there was no way she was going to be seeing those kids. But apparently, Kelly and Amy discussed the problems that Kelly had with Jim, who had now filed for a divorce. Yeah, and Amy's a pretty good listener, uh, as Kelly was talking about her marital issues. I just don't know what to do. How dare he divorce me? I'm the primary caregiver, Kelly told Amy. And according to Amy, Kelly seemed very angry. And after hearing Kelly's complaints, Amy suggested she get a job. Because Amy thought if she had a job, at least she could pay her attorney's fee. Well, that, and I think it would have been good for her to have something going on in her life. Yeah, I put down the, paying the attorney is one of the minor benefits. And just yeah, because Jim could take care of that. But Kelly really didn't want to get a job, and she wasn't happy with Amy's suggestion. Kelly and Amy talked and drank for about an hour. Then at about 10.30, Kelly's cell phone rang. Amy couldn't see the number that came up on the phone, but from hearing Kelly's side of this conversation, she felt sure that it had to be Jim. And during this short conversation, Jim and Kelly argued about custody of their children. Now, Amy realized that Kelly had never asked Jim how the children were doing, which seemed really odd. Although Amy didn't have any kids of her own, most of her friends did, and she knew that if they were out for the evening and they called home, they always asked how the kids were doing. After about five minutes on the phone, Kelly ended this call. Amy believed that Kelly was planning to continue her conversation with Jim later because she didn't want her friend to hear what they were talking about. After another 10 minutes or so, they paid the check and left the restaurant together. Now, this was around 11 p.m. Concerned about her friend's state of mind, Amy watched Kelly cross the street to her car. When Amy pulled out onto the street in her car, she saw Kelly still sitting in her car. Amy thought that Kelly was talking on her cell phone, but couldn't be 100% sure. Moments later, Kelly made the four-minute drive home. She changed into jeans and a sweater. Then she got back in her car and drove to a nearby Walgreens store. So carrying a light-colored purse, Kelly entered the store and walked to the aisle where the latex gloves were. She picked up a box of latex gloves from the shelf, tucked the box in the crook of her arm, and then walked to the window of the pharmacy to speak with someone. Then minutes later, Kelly walked back to the front of the store with a box of gloves still tucked under her arm. She walked past the checkout counter and left the store around 11.30 without paying for the gloves. Yeah, it was the next morning at around 8.30, this was June 23rd, when housekeeper Vicki Shams arrived for her job at Jim Cannon's house. She carried her key to the house as she walked to the front door, but was surprised when she found that the front door was unlocked. The first thing she noticed when she went inside was that the house was a real mess. She hadn't been there for three days, but it was in far more disarray than she would have expected. And it was quiet, too quiet. No one seemed to be there, not the children or Jim, and they were normally awake by the time she got there in the morning. Then she noticed something very strange. The door to the backyard was wide open. Vicky walked over to the back door and looked outside. Two cars were parked in the driveway, that's how many cars Jim had, and there was an empty beer can on the lawn. So not quite sure what to think, Vicky decided to mind her own business and just start her work. She gathered the dirty clothes from the hamper in the laundry room and threw them in the washing machine. Then she went to the kitchen, picked up the trash, and washed the dishes. 
At around 9 a.m., Carly Dewey, one of the children's nannies, showed up. By this time, Vicky was getting concerned about Jim and the kids. The baby Sophie should have been up by then. Vicky told Carly she was going to run upstairs and check on her. But when she got to Sophie's room, her crib was empty. She went to the bedroom the two boys shared, but there was no Tim or Henry there either. Something else was odd there, too. The chest of drawers in their room had been pushed in front of the closet, with the drawers facing the door. Everything that had been on top of the chest was now on the floor as well. So this is like blocking the the doorway. To the closet, yes. Now, there was no one in the master bedroom either, but it was a total mess. And when Vicky walked into the master bathroom, she saw that the wastebasket had been tipped over and trash was all over the floor. And then she noticed a dirty wine glass on the counter. So she picked up the glass and went back into the bedroom. And that's when she first saw the bloody towel on the floor beside the bed. So Vicky picked it up, a little confused, uh, but then put it in the washer with the rest of the dirty clothes. So Vicky put the wine glass in the kitchen sink. And then she told Carly about the mess upstairs. What the hell's going on? Where is everybody? Vicky asked. Jim's two cars were there, but there was no sign of him or of the children. Not anywhere in the house. They wondered if someone had been hurt and the ambulance had been called and taken him somewhere. Because that could explain the bloody towel and why there was nobody at home. So they decided to try calling Jim's cell phone. Carly took out her phone and called Jim, but there wasn't any answer. She left a message on the phone. Then Vicky suggested they go upstairs and look around. When the two women got to the boys' bedroom, Vicky asked Carly to help her move the chest away from the closet. And once they had moved it part of the way, Vicky told Carly she could finish it herself. So when the chest was moved out of the way, Vicky opened the closet door. It was dark inside the closet, but when her eyes got adjusted, she saw the palm of Jim Cannon's hand. And it was black. Ugh, not a good sign. So Vicky slammed the door shut. I would (laughs) too. It's like, oh, maybe if I shut this in, I won't have seen it. Scary. She turned around and stared at Carly with a look of shock on her face. Jim's in the closet, Vicky said. Carly ran out of the room to call 911, and Vicky slowly opened the closet door again, and this time a strong odor of bleach hit her. She leaned down to check on Jim, moving a pillow out from the side of his face, and, and then she knew. Jim Cannon was dead. Very dead. That would just be horrific. Wouldn't it? Yeah, it really would be terrifying, and you'd certainly never forget that. Carly told the 911 operator to send an ambulance, but then Vicky came to the phone and she told them that Jim was definitely dead and way past saving. The women really were now concerned about the three Cannon children who were missing. The first policeman to arrive at the house was Officer Albert Gordon, a 19-year veteran with the Metropolitan Nashville Police Department. He saw Vicki and Carly waiting on the front lawn of the house. When Gordon went into the house, he was met by two paramedics walking down the stairs from the boys' bedroom. They stopped and told Gordon the situation. Gordon then went to the boys' bedroom and looked inside the closet. After he saw Jim's body, he notified his sergeant and the detectives responsible for investigating crime scenes. Then he went outside to keep anyone but the investigators out of the house. While Gordon was inside, Vicki asked Carly to call Kelly Cannon's mother, Diane. Carly spoke to Diane for a couple of minutes, and then she gave the phone to Vicki. Diane asked Vicki what was wrong, and Vicki told her that Jim was dead. She told Diane to come to the house. Suddenly, Vicky fell into a real state of shock. She just couldn't move or even speak. She really couldn't say why exactly, but something that Diane had said convinced Vicky that Kelly's mother already knew that Jim was dead. So Diane, who lived about 10 minutes away, came to the Cannon house. By then, other investigators were already there. And right off the bat, Diane asked one of the police officers if her son-in-law was really dead but the officer said she couldn't release that information yet. During her conversation with the officer, Diane asked about her grandchildren, and she gave the police their names and ages. 
Then she said they were probably with their mother because that was the most logical place for them to be. So I think that's kind of strange because if she wasn't thinking her daughter was behind this at all, wouldn't you be afraid that a stranger had taken or done something to the children, the same one who had killed Jim? I would be thinking that. So I think just the fact that she was kind of assuming that Kelly had the children gives us an indication that she was at least suspicious that her daughter was behind this. Well, yeah. Plus, she must have known that Kelly was not supposed to be in contact with the kids. Of course, yes. So saying that the most logical place for them to be was with their mother isn't true. Yeah, it doesn't really make any sense, does it? No. Nope. So after speaking with the police, Diane called her son Bobby, who was visiting a local university with his son. She asked him to meet her at Jim's, and she also called Jim's work, as well as his divorce attorney, John Hollins, to tell him that Jim was dead. But curiously, she never called Kelly, and she didn't drive the five minutes to where Kelly was living either to give her the news. So that's, that's back to your suspicion that she already knew. Well, yeah, because wouldn't you want to be with your daughter and your grandchildren in a situation like oh, this? definitely. Yeah. Jim's attorney, John Hollins, would recall that Kelly's mother called his office at noontime on June 23rd. He had walked out of his office to go to lunch when he heard a legal assistant scream in the kitchen. He ran there and the assistant told him that Jim was dead. And what she actually said was, Jim Cannon is dead. Kelly killed him. This is Diane on the phone. So that's quite an assumption to make. So Hollins ran back to his office and picked up the phone, and Diane said to him, Kelly killed him. She finally killed him. <laughs> so Diane that, that's was... your own mother. <laughs> yeah. But it seemed like everyone thought that was the case. Who else would go and kill him? Especially considering she had the kids with her. It was very suspicious. That's for sure. So at that point, Diane was talking to the police, and she put one of the detectives on the phone with Hollins. The detective asked Hollins to bring him copies of all the court orders, so he had all the orders that the judge had entered in the divorce case copied for the police. Kelly wasn't supposed to have any contact with the kids, and that day she had all three kids with her. So when detectives had first arrived at the Cannon house, they had been briefed by other police on the scene. And after speaking with Vicky and Carly, they walked through the house looking for evidence. Now that's when they noticed that there was a window in the front of the house partially opened. And that would be unusual, right? That would be. It's June 23rd in Nashville. It's hot out. You would probably have the air running. But it could be a way to gain entry to the house. Well, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I'm not thinking Jim left it open. I'm thinking someone opened it. Yes. Yes. So the investigators walked upstairs and into the boys' bedroom, and that's where they found Jim's body lying on its side. It was obvious he'd been dead for quite some time. He was nude, cold to the touch, and rigor mortis had set in. His right arm was above his head, and his left arm was at his side. His position led the detectives to think that he had been dragged into the closet by that arm. There was blood coming out of his nose and mouth. There were marks basically parallel to each other, like something had been wrapped around his neck more than one time. So it looked like Jim had been strangled. He had one scratch on the left side of his chest, but no other signs of trauma were really obvious. Police didn't see any other signs of trauma, but there was a strong smell of bleach coming from inside the closet and from Jim's body as well. Just off to the left of Jim's head, there was an open container of bleach. A cap was on the floor of the closet. There was also a small pillow in front of Jim's face, and some of the children's clothing was under the lower part of his body. The clothes were discolored from the bleach as well. And behind the closet door, which opened inward, there was one white latex glove. And there was also a fingertip of a latex glove on the floor outside of the closet. A Motorola cell phone charger was also lying on the floor, and its cord had been ripped off. There were dried drops of blood on the floor in front of the bunk beds, and in the master bedroom down the hall, there is a spot of blood on the floor next to the bed. So a detective asked the housekeeper if there were any bleach bottles in the house. Vicky explained that the bleach was kept in the laundry room, right above the washer and dryer. In the laundry room, there was one open bottle of bleach on a back shelf. Vicky said that there had been a full bottle of bleach on the shelf, 
when she left uh, the previous Thursday. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. likely that's where it had come from. So later that day, as part of this investigation, detectives went to talk to Amy Houston, the woman who had met with Kelly the previous evening. Amy said that although Jim and Kelly had been having problems in their marriage for several years, Jim only had started talking to his friends about their problems in early 2008. Amy told them that until Kelly called her to meet that night, the last time she had talked to Kelly was back in April, right after Kelly had gotten out of rehab. Although Amy had been friends with both Jim and Kelly, her friendship with Kelly had suffered after Kelly asked her to help her get out of rehab early, and Amy had refused. So she didn't talk to Kelly after that until one call in April. Amy said that Kelly had called her the evening before Jim was found dead, and that she had seemed very distraught. Amy told the detective that when they talked about Kelly's marital problems, Amy realized that her friend wasn't so much distraught as she was angry. Throughout their conversation, Kelly didn't ask Amy if she knew how the kids were doing, and she kept repeating that she was the primary caregiver, and Jim didn't even know the names of his own children. Amy also told the detectives about the phone call Kelly received at the restaurant, which she believed had been from Jim. So as detectives processed the scene, they collected the glove and bagged it as evidence. The cord to the phone charger had been ripped off, and it had blood on it. They cut out pieces of the carpet to send back to the lab for more testing. The crime scene investigators also collected the bottle of bleach, some water bottles, a briefcase, a pair of eyeglasses, and a man's Rolex watch. After they had finished taking photos, investigators processed the open window for fingerprints. The wine glass in the sink was taken for DNA and fingerprint testing. The handles of the bathroom faucets in the front of the bathroom cabinet were swabbed to determine if the reddish-brown stains on the items were blood. And there were also some stains in the hallway, leading from the master bedroom to one of the children's bedrooms, that tested for blood, that tested positive for blood. Yeah, the investigators also collected a white latex glove that had been tossed over a branch of a tree in the backyard, and a similar glove that was hanging over a nearby shrub. Then that empty beer can was also swabbed for DNA. Two police officers were assigned to go to Kelly's condo on Elmington Avenue, which was about half a mile from Jim's house, so very close. They were going to check on Kelly and, of course, the well-being of her children. When they knocked on the door, Kelly answered. She was wearing a silky top, black jeans, and a dark sweater. In response to their questions, she identified herself as Kelly and allowed the police into the condo. The officers noticed that the two boys were playing video games. The little girl, Sophie, was wandering around the apartment. Neither the children nor Kelly appeared to be especially upset. The officers stayed there until a detective could arrive. Although the police officers told Kelly that they were there to make sure she and the children were okay, she never asked them why they were doing that. Yeah, that would seem to be an elementary question. You would think so. A little while later, Lieutenant Nancy Fielder took Kelly into her bedroom to ask her some questions. Kelly told Fielder that she hadn't seen Jim since May 22nd. Kelly said she had only been home for 45 days after getting out of rehab when Jim told her that he was going to keep the restraining order for 90 days and see how it goes. She added that he had threatened to push her while she was holding the baby. Kelly told the detectives that Jim had been calling her recently, and the last time she spoke to him was the previous night while she was having dinner with her friend Amy. She said he called her on the cell phone to say that he wanted to reconcile with her and that he'd let her see the kids. But no one else could back that up, and remember Amy thought that this call was quite contentious. Right, which by Kelly's account it wasn't. Exactly. When asked if she had gone to the house, Kelly said that she had gone there sometime before midnight, but she wasn't sure exactly what time it was. When she did arrive, she said, the baby was awake in her crib, and the boys were asleep in the master bedroom. She said that the back door was open and unlocked. Kelly said everything looked normal from the outside, but inside the house was a total mess. She said the lights were on in the front room, 
and there were beer cans in the family room. Kitchen was a wreck. Kelly said that she had walked around looking for Jim and calling his name. She went into the master bedroom for the two boys and into Sophie's room to get her. And she then went in the other upstairs rooms looking for Jim. So Kelly said that the room where Jim had been sleeping was in complete disarray. She said that when she had spoken with him on the phone, Jim had sounded desperate and scared. Kelly said he had told her he was being threatened, but he didn't tell her by whom. Yeah, that seems like just kind of a half-hearted effort. Yeah, well, we're trying to set up an alibi here, right? Well, yeah, and someone else who could have done it. Yeah. An alternate suspect. So Kelly said that she hadn't had much sleep since she picked up the kids at Jim's house because she was worried about Jim. She said she was also worried sick about her children. She said she had no idea where Jim was, but she didn't think that he would have just left the children alone. So Kelly admitted to seeing both of Jim's cars in the driveway, but said that she was freaked out and didn't know what to think or what to do. Kelly told the detectives that Jim had never left the kids alone before, but then again, they'd never been in this kind of situation before. He's quite desperate, she said. In response to their questions, Kelly told the detectives that Jim had arranged for her to move into her current place. I've been moved four times, she said. That's why everything's so discombobulated. Now, as they were talking with Kelly, Detective Stokes noticed Sophie was putting a short white straw about two inches long in her mouth. And when he told Kelly about it, she snatched the straw out of Sophie's hand and tried to hide it. When Stokes asked her what it was, Kelly said it was a juicy juice straw. But Stokes didn't believe her. It was short and fat, like a cut regular straw. So we're thinking she was snorting something, and that baby had picked it up and put it in her mouth, which means the baby may have ingested some cocaine or whatever. So she's definitely not safe to have these children with her. Doesn't sound like No. So the conversation moved on to Kelly's drug use. She said she had become addicted to the painkillers she was taking after she'd broken her back about three years earlier. She added that Jim was also taking her pain meds. Now, Kelly continued to talk, but often wasn't making a lot of sense. She told detectives that she'd lost a lot of weight because Jim had been having an affair and she got sick, not because she was addicted to narcotics. She said she was so sick that her weight dropped to 97 pounds. Yes, she did look emaciated at this point, but she said that she'd had pneumonia. She then said that she wanted a separation from Jim, and according to her, that was why Jim left the house and filed for divorce. He picked up the boys from daycare to have physical custody, and the next day he called an ambulance to come to her house, telling the children that she was an addict and she could be violent. After further questioning, Kelly admitted that she was still refilling the prescriptions for opiates, but she said it was only because Jim was taking them. Kelly said after Jim got temporary custody of the children, he dragged them from hotel to hotel without any of their belongings. She said that when she returned home after being released from the hospital, Jim and the kids weren't there. Kelly said she was so desperate to see her children, and she was in such bad physical shape because of the pneumonia, that she had admitted herself to Cumberland Heights on the advice of her therapist, and she claimed that although Jim said she could see the children, he then didn't allow it. So she was then going off on several topics, and the detectives wondered, was she on drugs at that very moment? It seemed likely. Yeah, it was a pretty disjointed conversation. Absolutely. So when asked how long she had been in the house when she got the children, Kelly estimated that it was about 20 minutes. The only thing she took from the house, she said, were some things for the kids. She said that she was so frantic to find them at the house alone that all she could think to do was get the children and bring them back to her place. Now, when asked if she had ever considered calling the police, Kelly said she just wanted to get the kids to safety and planned to call the police that very day. So that just doesn't ring true. Not in the least. Even if you were frantic and wanted to get the kids out of the house, which could be understandable in certain circumstances. As soon as you got out of the house, you'd be calling 911 because the house was a mess and you can't find your ex-husband or your estranged husband. And the kids, you know, the baby's crying. What's going on here? 
So it really makes no sense that she would just go home and go to sleep. None. Finally, a detective informed Kelly that Jim had been found dead in the house. Seemingly surprised, Kelly asked where he was found. The detective didn't give her any more information, but she did ask Kelly if she had anyone who would come and stay with her. So Kelly gave the detective her mother's name and phone number. Kelly agreed to giving a more formal interview with the police in the next couple of days. When she was asked if Jim could have hurt himself, she said, well, maybe. The detective asked if Jim was a stable guy, and Kelly said, yeah, but he's a real bad drinker, which is not something anyone else had said about him. And while she was speaking with Kelly, the detective noticed several medicine bottles on the nightstand in her bedroom. So it was prescribed to her, and when they finished talking, Kelly went into the bathroom and thoroughly washed her hands. Then the lead detective, Brad Putnam, showed up. He introduced himself to Kelly and asked if they could go into her bedroom to talk. Once in the bedroom, he asked her about the last time she saw or spoke with Jim. Now, he saw her demeanor as quite odd, because she didn't seem at all upset or surprised about Jim's death. And odder still was the question she asked Putnam just then. Do I need an attorney? Putnam said she wasn't under arrest, he just wanted to find out when she had seen her talk to Jim last, and if she knew of someone who might have wanted to hurt him. Kelly told Putnam about the call she received from Jim the previous evening when she'd been out with Amy, and she said that Jim was frantic because someone had threatened him, but again she said he never mentioned who had threatened him. And after Kelly finished telling her story, Detective Putnam asked if she would sign a consent form so the detectives could search her condo and her car and she signed it without hesitation. He also asked her what she had been wearing the previous evening when she went to dinner with Amy and what time she had gone to get the children from Jim's. Now, at first she said she'd been wearing jeans and a white tank top, but then she later amended that to say she'd been wearing a dress when she met Amy at the restaurant. During the search of the condo, Putnam took a pair of white sandals. There was a small red spatter on the side of the heel of the left shoe, and the detective thought it might be significant because earlier that day he had spoken to Amy Houston, who had described the clothes Kelly was wearing. Amy's description had included white candy sandals. Yeah, Putnam also took a pair of blue jeans and a white tank top. He also took a box of Walgreens latex gloves, which had been found in a brown paper bag in the living room, and a piece of the box had been ripped off. While the police were doing this search, Kelly's attorney, Warwick Robinson, called, and he told Kelly not to answer any more questions from the police. He asked to talk to Putnam, who explained that Kelly had signed a consent form so police could search her condo in her car. Putnam said they hadn't started to search the car yet, but he was having it towed to the station. So attorney Robinson asked him not to search the car. Putnam agreed, but he said he'd get a search warrant, no problem. Putnam had already looked inside of the vehicle and noticed that part of the corner of a box of Walgreens latex gloves was in there, and it matched what he had found in her living room. Before he left Kelly's condo, Putnam made arrangements for Jim's sister to take custody of the three Cannon children, because obviously Kelly had violated the custody agreement when she took the kids from Jim's house. Then a little while later, Kelly's attorney went to Jim's house and told the police they could search Kelly's car. That's the car she had been driving for the past few weeks. But he requested that Kelly be allowed to use one of Jim's cars for transportation. And the detectives agreed to release Jim's black GMC Yukon after they were done searching it. And after police received permission to search Kelly's car, crime scene investigators took it and began to process it. They collected potential evidence from the car, a piece of a box of latex gloves, a piece of a Band-Aid wrapper from the front seat, the adhesive part of a Band-Aid, and some gauze that had what looked like blood on it. After they collected these items, they packaged them up and took them in to be logged in as evidence. So Rick Green was a friend of Kelly's through her mother, Diane, and sometime that evening of June 23rd, Rick got a call at work from a friend, and the friend said that Kelly had killed Jim. 
Rick then sent Kelly a text message that same night at about 10, asking if she was okay. Kelly called Rick back and asked him to come and see her at her condo. So Rick went over, and the first question he asked Kelly was, What happened to your husband? Kelly said she'd been out with a friend at a restaurant and that Jim had called her and he was very upset. And when she got to his house, the door was wide open. She told Rick she could hear her baby crying, so she went upstairs and looked around, but couldn't find Jim, so she took the kids and left the house. Now at this point, Rick never asked Kelly outright if she had killed her husband. When detectives returned to the condo with a search warrant at 10.40 p.m., no one was there. The police waited in the parking lot, and within an hour, Kelly showed up in the Yukon. She was followed closely by a man driving a Dodge pickup truck. And after Kelly and the man parked their vehicles, he got out of the pickup and walked over to Kelly's car. When Detective Putnam got out of their car and walked toward Kelly and the man, the man backed away from Kelly and got back into his truck. Putnam told Kelly about the search warrant, so she got out of her car and walked into her condo, and the man in the truck left without saying anything. Now once inside, the detectives noticed a pornographic movie playing on the TV, and that seemed pretty odd. Kelly was still wearing the black jeans she'd been wearing earlier that day, and Putnam told her he needed to take the pants back to the police station with him, so she went into her bedroom to change. Now when she came out of her room, she did give the pants to Putnam, but she told him she had urinated on them. No further explanation why she would have done that. So as the police were leaving, Kelly said she was afraid of staying by herself. She actually got kind of needy at the last minute but the detectives told her just to call 911 if she heard or saw anything unusual. So Rick Green returned to the condo the next evening. When he got there, Kelly was sitting on the floor, looking through papers that were in a fireproof box. This was a fairly large box, about the size of a carry-on suitcase, and Green had not seen it before. When he asked about what the papers were, she said they were the children's social security numbers, birth certificates, and insurance policies. Oh, and there's also over $2,000 in $20 bills in the box. Those Kelly's counting the cash, Rick asked her where she got it. She said she had taken out an advance on her credit card. Now, until that day, Kelly's financial situation and her credit rating had been really terrible. Rick had been under the impression that Kelly had either maxed out her credit cards or that Jim had cut them off. So... It'd be difficult, if that's true, to get an advance on your card. Yeah. So Rick started asking her questions about Jim's death. And now he got right to the point. Look me in the eye and tell me that you didn't know his body was in the closet when you left that house, Rick said. Without answering, Kelly got up and walked into the kitchen. When she came back, she said, Rick, I can't tell you anything because I don't want you to have to lie. Well, that doesn't sound very good. No. Oh. So, let's fast forward to the evening of June 25th. Kelly was picked up on three outstanding warrants for violating Jim's order of protection, prohibiting her from having custody of their three children. Putnam had already gone to look for Kelly at her condo, but she wasn't there, so a bolo was put out for her and the Yukon, and she was found pretty quickly. Followed by a cruiser with the lights and sirens going, Kelly did pull over and stop right away, though. Finally, she did pull into a Walgreens parking lot. The first thing the officer noticed was that Kelly's hands were shaking uncontrollably. He looked into the car, and he noticed that it was full of merchandise from a local store. Just random stuff. She asked the officers to call her brother Bobby, who was still at the local university, and he agreed to come and pick up the Yukon and her purchases. The police took Kelly back to the station, where she was charged with three counts of criminal contempt for violating the order of protection. Photos of Kelly were taken, showing an old bruise and a cut on her left wrist. There was also a dark area on Kelly's wrist, like she'd removed a bandage there. After they got another search warrant, police took a DNA sample from Kelly, 
She was booked through night court and was released on a $45,000 bond shortly after 9 in the morning, Thursday, June 26th. Now, at that point, the police hadn't officially named Kelly as a suspect in Jim's death. Kelly absolutely denied having anything to do with Jim's death, and she even defended the fact that she had taken her children in violation of a court order. Although you have to say, even if you think you're protecting your kids, you would immediately call the police, especially since you know you're not supposed to have them. Oh, absolutely. So Jim Cannon's body was autopsied by Dr. Thomas Deering, who was the medical examiner on duty the day that Jim's body arrived. As the ME, Deering's job was to find out why Jim had died, as well as show how he died. Now, the first thing Deering and his associates did was to photograph Jim's body, which had arrived nude. They cleaned him up and took photos of his injuries and a series of x-rays. During the autopsy, Deering and his team noted that his neck was scraped and bruised, and most of these bruises were long and thin. Jim also had a bruise on his left cheek, scrapes around his nose, and a big purple bruise on his upper left arm. And there was also a brown mark on the back of Jim's right shoulder. Now, this mark was described as post-mortem. It looked like he'd been dragged, and the top layer of his skin had been scraped off. Ew. Rug rash. Yeah. Deering saw a weave-like pattern on Jim's skin, which may have come from a rug. He also noted that the blood vessels in both of Jim's eyes had hemorrhaged. When Deering pulled Jim's eyes open, he noticed that there had been so much bleeding, he couldn't see the white of his right eye. And the bleeding in Jim's left eye was patchier, so some of the white was visible. This was from a cluster of petechiae, tiny red dots that are pinpoint size. These occur when the capillaries in Jim's eyes burst. Now, the presence of petechiae, especially to the degree that was seen in Jim's eyes, meant there had been a lot of pressure on the blood vessels in, in his eye, leading them to burst and bleed. So Deering determined that Jim had been asphyxiated, which cut off blood and oxygen to his brain. And strangulation is a form of asphyxia because the blood vessels and or the airway is cut off. You can strangle someone with your hands, or you can do it with a ligature of some kind, of rope or cord or something that lets you put pressure on the neck. Because the petechiae were severe, and because Jim had lines of bruises and scrapes around his neck, Deering was certain that Jim had been strangled with some kind of a ligature. That Jim's face was dark red was further evidence that he had been strangled with a ligature. His face was red because the pressure had caused blood to be trapped in his head. There were no bruises or abrasions that looked like they had been made by someone's fingers, but there were several abrasions on his scalp. He didn't have a skull fracture, but there had been some kind of blunt force trauma to the side of his head. One thing that was interesting, too, were bruises on Jim's tongue. When Deering examined Jim's tongue, he was surprised by the number of bruises inside of the tongue. These bruises went all the way to the back of the tongue. And one of the ways Jim's tongue could have been bruised like this was if someone had stuffed something in his mouth like a gag and he had tried to push it back out with his tongue. As part of this autopsy, Deering also dissected Jim's neck. He cut through each thin layer of muscle and removed the skin so he could fold them back one at a time and look for injuries inside the neck, like bruises in the case of a strangulation. He examined Jim's larynx, his hyoid bone, which is the U-shaped bone that sits above the larynx, and his trachea. Deering found squeezing-type injuries and hemorrhaging in the ligaments, which indicated the person who killed him had used a lot of force. There were bruises everywhere. There were actually so many injuries, in fact, that he knew immediately that Jim had been strangled. Toxicology tests indicated that Jim's blood alcohol was 0.15, which is twice the legal limit, for driving. Now, Jim Cannon's family had made plans to have his body cremated on Friday, June 27th, but then Kelly filed a motion to stop it that morning. Anna Stallings, Jim's sister, wanted him cremated, and she had control of what was to be done with her brother's remains from a court decision. Anna's attorney had filed the motion giving Anna control, only because at that point they didn't know where Kelly was. Then another thing that was dealt with in court that day was the custody of the kids who were staying with Jim's sister. 
Kelly's attorney told the judge that Jim's will designated Kelly's brother as their guardian if something happened to him. But the judge didn't rule on that issue at that particular hearing. Kelly was allowed to view Jim's body on Friday afternoon before he was cremated. The next day, a member of Jim's family called the police to come out to Jim's house because a locksmith was changing the locks with Kelly's attorney's supervision. Police arrived at the scene. They told Kelly's attorney and Jim's family members that they needed to resolve their disagreements in civil court. Because the house had been in Kelly's name since 2005, her lawyer had advised her to change the locks so Jim's family couldn't take anything out of the house. Yeah, it was July 1st, 2008, when Kelly appeared in court to answer the charges that she violated an order of protection that had prohibited her from having contact with her three children. The charges came from the night before Jim's body was found, when she took the children from his house and brought them back to her condo. Kelly had hired two attorneys who would represent her. Both of them saw Jim's allegations in the divorce petition to be completely unfounded. Kelly hadn't filed a response to Jim's divorce petition because she'd always wanted to get back together with him, they said. And Jim had even kept Kelly as the executor of his will. So as Kelly left the hearing, she told reporters that she was devastated by Jim's death and everything that was happening in the aftermath. Kelly had every intention of fighting for custody of her children. And according to her attorneys, Kelly was completely heartbroken. She had been shunned by Jim's family and friends, who saw her as a suspect in Jim's death, and believed that she was continuing to abuse drugs. Yeah, because Kelly was saying that it was actually Jim who had been the drug addict. It was Jim who begged her to violate the orders of protection he took out against her, she claimed. And she told the Nash- Nashville scene about the call she received from Jim the night she was out with Amy. According to Kelly, Jim was afraid on the night he died. During the call, Kelly said Jim told her that he loved her. He told her that he wanted her to go over to the house. So Kelly said she drove to the house around midnight. Her plan was to peek inside the windows to make sure that everything was okay. But her plans changed when she drove into the driveway and noticed that the back door to the house was wide open. And that might be the point where you call 911 because you know you're not supposed to go inside. You think? Yeah, I think so. (laughs) So Kelly said that all the downstairs lights were on and some of the furniture had been turned over, so everything was in disarray. She said she called out for Jim, but he didn't answer. Kelly said she then went upstairs to the children's rooms and took them for their own safety. She also looked in the boys' bedroom where Jim had been sleeping, but it was empty, she said. Kelly said she knew Jim had been sleeping there because his briefcase and glasses were in that room, but she said she never saw Jim at all that night. Kelly said even though she figured something must be wrong, she didn't call the police. Now she was asked to respond to claims which Jim had made in his divorce filing that she told him she was hearing voices inside the house. According to Kelly, though, Jim had made up that story because he was trying to cover up that he was having an affair. Kelly said what really happened was that she called home when she was out with the boys and another woman had answered the phone. Then when she got home, she asked Jim who the woman was, and Jim became so angry, she said, that he kicked the family's takeout dinner across the floor. But of course, Kelly's the only one who said any of this. Yeah, there's absolutely nobody that can back that assertion up. Yeah, no woman came forward to say, yes, I was sleeping with Jim. And also, Kelly really had her own ideas that she was sharing about who murdered her husband. She mentioned former colleagues, a mistress, and a possible stalker. Kelly said she had never left Jim because she loved him. In Kelly's mind, Jim was just covering up his jealousies and anger by accusing her of being a drug abuser and mentally unstable. Kelly said she had asked him repeatedly to stop drinking, and she'd asked him to go to marriage counseling, but that Jim had refused. She said she was trying to keep things as normal as possible for their kids. But Jim filed for divorce and petitioned the court for injunctions to keep Kelly away. But still, according to Kelly, Jim had wanted her back. Kelly claimed it was Jim's attorney, John Hollins, who'd been pushing him to go ahead with the divorce. Now, there might be a little bit of truth to that, because I think that Jim would have been willing to take her back if things had changed, if she'd really made some grand gestures and changes. 
And I think part of what was happening was John Collins was saying to Jim, it's not safe. You really need to go ahead with this. Yeah. Yeah, because there had been instances where she seemed very out of control. Now, Kelly added that the May 21st incident, when she put Sophie in the car and tried to leave, crashing into Jim's car, just didn't happen the way Jim claimed. She said Jim was angry at her because she had called his psychiatrist to tell him that Jim was addicted to sedatives. Kelly said that he shoved her and Sophie in the kitchen, and she was just trying to protect her baby and herself from him. Sure. So on the morning of July 10th, 2008, Kelly was arrested at her mother's house in West Nashville and charged with strangling Jim Cannon to death. Kelly's mother, Diane, defended her, said there was no way her daughter could have killed Jim. Diane told the local media that she and Kelly were in bed sleeping when police showed up at the door. Kelly had moved in with Diane two weeks earlier after finishing another round of treatment for substance abuse. Diane said that it was absurd to think there was any way her daughter could have strangled her husband to death. After all, Kelly weighed 90 pounds, and Jim had weighed about 190, Diane said. But the police, along with Jim's family and friends, believed that the right person was charged. Although the three children had been living with Jim's sister, Kelly was trying to get them back, and in fact, she had a custody hearing scheduled for the same morning she got arrested. Yeah, so I think that was done that day to prevent her from possibly getting custody. Yeah. Although I don't think she would have. Still, Kelly filed a motion to suppress two statements that she had given to the police, a motion to suppress evidence that had been seized during searches of the crime scene, and a motion challenging the admissibility of certain expert testimony. But all of these motions were denied. So her trial began on April 26, 2010. The first witness for the prosecution was Kelly's 11-year-old son. He testified that after his mother had moved out, he and his brother had started sleeping in their parents' former room, and his father would sleep either in his office or in their former bedroom. He said that on the night of the murder, he had fallen asleep in the parents' room with his brother, and sometime later his mother woke him up and said, we have to go. He said that he asked his mother if he could get a pillow from his former bedroom, but she said no. When he woke up, he said he realized that his two siblings were already ready to leave and he believed this was sometime between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. The son also testified that as they were leaving, his mother had led all of them down the front set of stairs rather than down the more convenient back set of stairs that was near the bedroom where his father had been sleeping. He said that he couldn't get anything from that room, not even his clothes. He said that his mother had been jumpy and nervous, and he was scared and confused. He said that his mother didn't talk to them at all on the way to her condo, and she didn't make any phone calls before she went to sleep at her place either, at least as far as he knew. The son testified that the next morning they had been watching cartoons for a few hours when the police started knocking on the front door. He assumed that his dad had sent the police to find them. And he also testified that his parents had had a big fight the night before, and his mother had chased his father with a knife in order to stop him from calling the police. That is so damning. Not good. Not good for Kelly. On cross-examination, the defense questioned him about a prior statement he had made to police about asking to get a pillow on the night of the murder. He said he had wanted to get a pillow from his old room because he didn't like the pillows his mother had at her place. He also said that he was not sure where his father had been sleeping that night but that he had told him and his brother that that was where he was going to sleep. Right, plus his briefcase and glasses and things were there. Yeah. The housekeeper, Vicki Shams, testified next, and she testified that she had been working for the family for about six weeks before the murder happened. She said that she had arrived at the house on the morning of June 23, 2008, at 8.30 a.m., which was the usual. She testified that the front door had been unlocked and the back door was open which was not usual. She said that many items in the house were out of place and there was no sign of Jim and she thought the children were still asleep. But normally Jim was up when she arrived because he had to be at work at 9 a.m. She testified that nanny Carly Dewey arrived soon after she did and soon after that she went up to check on the baby, 18-month-old Sophie, who should have been awake by then. 
That's when she saw Sophie wasn't in her crib and that the other kids were gone as well. She said she saw a wine glass and a turned over trash can in the master bathroom, a bloody towel beside one of the beds, and the chest of drawers in the former boys' room was out of place. Shams told the court that she asked the nanny to help her move the chest of drawers back to its normal spot. It had been moved in front of the bedroom closet. And when they moved the chest, she said, they opened the closet door, and that's when she saw Jim Cannon's body inside of the closet. She said that his skin was blackened, and he was obviously long deceased. Then she asked the nanny to call 911, which Carly did, and... Vicky testified that she smelled a strong odor of bleach coming from that closet as well. She also said that after the emergency responders arrived at the scene, she had called Kelly's mother, Diane, and told her that Jim was dead. She said that she was shocked by Diane's response, which indicated to her that Diane already knew that Jim was dead. On cross-examination, the defense questioned Vicki Shams about a statement she had made to detectives the day after the murder. And in this statement, Shams had told the police that the house had looked like it had been completely unattended for the last three days, and that there were several alcohol bottles in a brown bag downstairs. Shams testified that during the time she worked for Jim, she had seen him drink every day, but never more than one drink per day. And on redirect, Shams testified that she had never seen Jim intoxicated. Jim's attorney and friend John Hollins testified that Jim had contacted him back in February of 2008 about getting a divorce. On February 29th, Jim had met with him in his office and gave him information for the divorce filing and a request to get temporary custody of his children. Temporary custody was granted and so was a restraining order preventing Kelly from threatening him, harassing him, or harming him in any way. Hollins testified that he had filed a motion for a temporary injunction for the same purpose in early March, and this gave Jim exclusive possession of the home and prevented Kelly from coming to the house at all. Hollins also testified that Jim had called him on May 22, 2008, about the domestic violence incident that had occurred the evening before, and then Jim had sought and was granted an order of protection. Allen said he received a call from Jim's mother-in-law, Diane, on Monday, June 23rd, telling him that Jim was dead. He also said that there was an informal agreement in place between Kelly and Jim when Jim died, and this agreement said that if Kelly got drug and alcohol treatment, she could return to the family home. But of course she didn't, so she couldn't. Kelly's mother, Diane, testified that on June 23rd, 2008, Her daughter was living in a condo separate from her family. But after hearing about Jim's death, she did not call her daughter or go to her daughter's residence, even though it's just minutes away. So that's kind of one of the most interesting things here to me, is the mother's response to this. Because you would think if you find out your son-in-law has been killed and the children are missing, that's the first thing you do. Remember, it was only like half a mile away from the house. Yeah. So why didn't she? That was a big deal. So on cross-examination, Diane admitted that she and her daughter had been somewhat estranged, but no one else thought that. She also said that on the day before the murder, she had talked to her daughter several times about getting together for dinner, but they never actually did. On redirect, the prosecutor asked Diane about a nearly one-hour phone conversation between her and her daughter on the day before the murder and Diane claimed she didn't remember that call at all, which was really not very believable. (laughs) No, a one-hour call. Yes, right before a murder. Crime scene investigator for the Metro Nashville Police Department testified about photographs she had taken of the crime scene on the morning of June 23rd. She testified about finding two white latex gloves in the backyard and an empty beer can in the driveway. An analyst in the identification section of the police department testified that nine different sets of fingerprints were found at the crime scene. She was able to identify Kelly's prints on the children's bedroom closet door frame, but none were found on the door itself. She was able to identify Kelly's prints on the outside of the partially open window to the house. Yeah, so that was kind of a bombshell there. Yeah. Then a bartender from the Hickory Falls bar 
testified that back on May 29, 2008, he was working when Kelly came in. He said she had stayed for about 45 minutes and had told him that she was going through a divorce. Testified that Kelly told him that she had found out her husband had been having an affair and told him if her husband tried to take her baby, she would kill him. Jeez. The bartender testified that she ate her dinner at the bar and drank several glasses of wine. He said that she repeated the claim that she would kill her husband several times and that she appeared to be distraught, bitter, and emotionally unstable. Yeah, I don't know if those descriptions are really something the bartender should be able to say. Although I guess it's just his opinion. It's just an observation. Right? Yeah, yeah. So the state forensic pathologist, Dr. Thomas Deering, testified that Jim had weighed 163 pounds when he died. So not 190, like Diane said. Yeah. And he had died from strangulation, most likely by ligature. He also testified that Jim had suffered multiple blunt force trauma to his head. He said that while great force had been used to strangle him, the force could have been generated by someone who was not overly strong if the killer had used a ligature and the victim was struggling. An agent from the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation testified that a blood stain found on Kelly's jeans had tested positive for DNA from both Jim and Kelly. She also had found Kelly's DNA on the inside of the latex glove found in the children's bedroom. Uh oh. That's a big deal. Also, Jim's DNA and blood were identified on the base of the Motorola phone charger that was found at the crime scene. So as you can probably tell at this point, the case was not going well for Kelly. It doesn't appear to be. No. And it's not going to get better. The lust prevention supervisor from Walgreens identified and authenticated store video footage of Kelly stealing a box of latex gloves. And this was played for the jury. Yeah, I guess what Kelly had said is uh, she didn't take the stand, but earlier she had said that that wasn't her in the video, but right. it's obviously her. Kelly's psychiatrist testified that she had been treating her in the spring of 2008 for anxiety and depression, panic disorder, and PTSD. She testified that Kelly was not psychotic, and on cross-examination, the doctor said that Kelly had been mixing her prescribed meds with alcohol and pain medications. So this could have led to some of her strange behaviors. Absolutely it could have. I mean, I'm not saying it as an excuse for her, but I really don't think she was completely in her right mind. And I think that if she was really enraged with Jim, even though she was that small, she would certainly be capable. So in the prosecution's closing argument, the prosecuting attorney said that Kelly had planned Jim's death. She said Kelly would not allow Jim to take her babies. She knew she would lose child custody in the divorce because of her drug problem. So the only way she felt like she could win was to take Jim out of the picture, and that's what she did. So April 29, 2010, after deliberating for only about an hour, the jury found Kelly guilty of first-degree premeditated murder. Kelly was given a life sentence in prison, and she'll be eligible for parole in 2061. And the family of Jim Cannon released this statement after Kelly's conviction. We are grateful to have this behind us. We feel that justice has been served, and thank the members of the jury for their careful attention to the facts of the case. Our family appreciates the efforts of the local authorities and the support and well wishes of everyone as we turn our focus onto our family. Yes, yeah, so the Cannon's three children were placed in the custody of Jim Cannon's sister, Anna, and because the house had been in Kelly's name, Kelly was able to sell it with the help of her brother and keep the proceeds. Kelly filed a post-conviction petition alleging ineffective assistance of counsel, which was denied, and then on appeal she asserted that the post-conviction court erred by preventing her use of trial exhibits for demonstration and she challenged the validity of the search warrants. Her conviction, though, was again affirmed, so she remains in the Tennessee prison for women. So this is a pretty straightforward case, but I think that there are a lot of issues here that are worth considering. For example, domestic violence, it isn't always the man. 
And I think that sometimes people kind of laugh. Oh, she's 90 pounds. How could she do anything? But if someone's like really worked up and on drugs and all that, of course they can be dangerous. And she was certainly dangerous to her children and herself as well. Definitely. Yeah. So a quick reminder to our listeners before we move on to listener feedback. We do have a premium option of TCB, which gives you early ad-free and bonus shows. And we always do a bonus case each month plus often throw in a recap and discussion of a true crime show. That's often Dateline, but what was it that I was talking about doing next month? It wasn't a murder, but it was a fascinating case we watched on Hulu or something. What was that called? Do you remember? Not off the top of my head. Where did it occur? You don't know that either? No, I mean, (laughs) we watch so many of these things. I can't keep them all straight. Okay. I think the title was How to Create a Sex Scandal, something like that. It was um, a series, like a limited series, on a case where an adult was convincing children to say that they were abused. So I found it fascinating. And even though it's not a murder, which is our normal, I think we might do just a quick recap of that and chat about it. Because that was interesting. It was really interesting. So if this interests you... We do appreciate your support, and we will work hard to give you entertaining bonus shows. If you prefer, you can also subscribe for these benefits at patreon.com forward slash tiegrabber. Some other ways to support our show are to give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever it is that you listen, or send us an email or a voicemail with your feedback and case suggestions. Also, one thing that really helps is if you just tell your friends to check out the show. Word of mouth really works. And if you do have feedback or case suggestions to share, you can send us an email to truecrimebrewery at tigrabber.com. And voicemails can be sent by clicking on the voicemail link in our show notes or on our website. So let's see what Dick has brought us. It's time for listener feedback. Dick has brought you a couple case suggestions in some emails from listeners. The voicemails have really trickled off, so I'll put in a plea. (laughs) We always enjoy listening to some voicemails from people who have suggestions or comments. Oh, absolutely. But it it is something that kind of, you know, it's an up and down thing. Yeah, it is. So maybe we should offer some kind of uh, swag if people leave a voicemail with a case suggestion. What do you think? Some stickers or something like that. Oh, we could do something. Sure. Yeah, we could do that. We can plead. <laughs> I do like to hear it from the listener's voice. I really do enjoy that. But we also like the emails, which we get plenty of. We do get plenty of those. So I'll read this case suggestion from Mike. Hi, Jill. I continue to enjoy TCB. You all have done some fascinating episodes lately. I'm amazed at the amount of detailed research you all put into your shows. I'm really hoping you and Dick will have a chance to take a look at the Madeline Murray O'Hare and family murder case from back in the 90s, because I think this case has all the elements of an absorbing TCB episode. It has revenge, kidnapping, holding people hostage, and eventually murder. Also, the killers turning on one of their own. And it's not one that has been covered much. Madeline O'Hare was a fascinating personality, too, abrasive, sarcastic, and extremely outspoken. But she ran afoul of the wrong person, psychopath David Waters, who was formerly one of her employees, who vowed revenge. One day in August of 1995, Madeline, her son John, and granddaughter Robin all suddenly disappeared, leaving a mysterious note on the door of the American atheist organization that they led. For weeks and then months, no one heard from them again, and when it was discovered that $600,000 had been withdrawn by John from the AA organization's accounts after the three disappeared, it looked like they had absconded with the money and fled the country. Only much later would the horrible truth be learned. Also, the psychology of the people involved is really interesting. Apparently, Madeline exercised a great deal of influence and control over her son and granddaughter. They both lived with her and were well into adulthood. Neither married or had any romantic relationships because Madeline didn't want them to. 
Also, the background on David Waters and the other two killers is interesting, and the way the whole truth was eventually painstakingly pieced together, and not by the police either. Anyway, I know people are always suggesting cases, but I think if you look at this one, you'll find it very compelling. It was covered on Forensic Files Season 7, Episode Without a Prayer, and the book America's Most Hated Woman, The Life and Gruesome Death of Madeline Murray O'Hare. All right, Mike. Sounds good? Yeah. Madeline Murray O'Hare was just a basically a nasty person. Okay. I mean, I, I think some of her work in terms of you know being an atheist and that is kind of worthwhile. But she's maybe not a Holocaust denier, but a minimizer. I think she claimed that only a million Jews had been killed and not six million. Oh, only. Yeah, only. <laughs> yeah. And that the death camps were really just supply depots. What do you mean supply depots? Pe- people, depots? People were working for the German war effort. Oh, and they didn't get murdered? According to her. Wow. So She sounds like a real fucking trip. Yeah. Well, she sounds like a predecessor for Marjorie Taylor Greene <laughs> and, and those whack jobs. Yeah, or Mel Gibson. But this would be a good case to look at, so... Okay. Thanks, Mike. So I'm going to have you read the email from Susan with the case suggestion. Susan has a case suggestion. Her, her note says, I found your channel not too long ago. I really enjoy the cases I've seen so far, and I'd like to know if you could do the Bricka family murders. So Jerry Bricka... His wife, Linda, and their daughter, Debbie, were a young family living in a Cincinnati suburb called Bridgetown. The last time anyone in the neighborhood saw Jerry was when he took the trash cans out on September 25th, 1966. So this is an old case. On the 27th, after no signs of the family for two days, the police were called, and inside that house were the bodies of the Brickas. They had all been stabbed to death. Wow, how many family members was this? Mother, father, and daughter. Okay. So the case remains unsolved to this day. J.T. Townsend, who's a Cincinnati author and historian, has followed the case intently over the years, and he believes that the case can still be solved. He's the author of Summer's Almost Gone, about the murders, and he has a Facebook page called Bricka Unlocked. Townsend has five suspects in mind, and two of them still living. Huh. Because, again, this is 60 years ago, just about. Right, right. Now, they they had some DNA that went to one of the uh, companies that do ancestral DNA analysis. There weren't any matches. And there are, there are some hairs that were recovered. Might be suitable for testing, but I don't have any results on that. Okay. Well, thank you, Susan. We'll definitely look into that. That does sound really good. Yeah. Really fascinating. I shouldn't say good. <laughs> But it sounds like something that would be worth talking about. How's that? Would be. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening. We really appreciate it. We hope you're doing well. And we'll see you next time at the quiet end. Come on down. We've got plenty of room. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye, guys.